But as a child, I mean, Asbury Park was the place to go. It was just full of all kinds of fun house um, carousels. There were two carousels in Asbury. Um, it was just very magical. Um, at my father's generation, there was um, the bowling that they had people that were pin setters, um, shooting range type of thing, just everything you want. Uh, a guy that you would have your caricature take in Zad, um, Fairbanks, she got your weight guest. Just fun. In 1870, much of the Jersey Shore was still virtually uninhabited. From Long Branch down to Long Beach, there were some scattered farms, a few inns and taverns, along with a small number of fishing and hunting lodges. There was Chadwick's in the area of La Valette. Another sporting lodge lay further south and across the inlet near Barnegat Light. At the southern tip of Long Beach, Thomas Bond's Beach House welcomed both gentlemen and ladies to some sporting fun and a taste of the salty air. The beach house looked across to a few small hotels and inns on Tucker's Island. South of Little Egg Inlet, there was Atlantic City and Cape May. All the rest was barren coastland, occupied by cattle brought over from the mainland to graze. Many shore towns and seaside resorts would be established from 1870 to 1900. Monmouth County's 30 miles of coastline began in the north at Sandy Hook and sprawled south to Squan Village. In the 1880s, the people of Bayshore in northern Monmouth built a 400-foot pier extending out into Raritan Bay. Steamships from New York City began docking there. Soon afterwards, several hotels were built, along with over 150 cottages. An outdoor amphitheater was created, and an indoor auditorium was built. By 1887, the citizens of Bayshore decided that Atlantic Highlands was a catchier name and officially adopted it. The town has the highest point on the eastern seaboard, south of Maine. Across the bay from the Highlands is a six-mile barrier peninsula that goes by the name of Sandy Hook. In the late 1880s, visiting yachts from the America's Cup races docked in Sandy Hook Bay, mooring at Spermacetti Cove and Horseshoe Cove. Fort Hancock was built on the Barrier Island and from 1895 to 1974 provided coastal defense for New York City and its harbor. South of Sandy Hook was Seabright. In 1865, one mile of this barrier beach could be purchased for $5 an acre. By the late 1880s, some lots were selling for $7,000 an acre. Seabright was a harsh lesson in how not to develop a beach. Large elegant cottages and mansions were built along the beach behind shoddy bulkheads, then landscaped 
with grass and gardens. It was spectacular for a while, but storms in September 1889 washed out the railroad and several cottages sailed out to sea. The Octagon House, built on the ocean opposite the Navasink River, along with the Ocean House, eventually met the fate of Atlantic storms that flooded the peninsula. Of the number of hotels built there, only the Peninsula House survived. In the 1860s, the tiny fishing village of Nauvoo sat completely surrounded by Seabray. Boats could be seen drawn up on the shore, ice houses up on the bluff, nets drying in the sun. Out to sea, boats could be seen rolling over the white caps making for the horizon. What a bold contrast this small village of fishermen was from Long Branch or Seabright. Local bluefish, bass, and weakfish, as well as clams and crabs, kept Seabright and Long Branch hotels stocked with the finest and fresh seafood. Down at Long Branch, the rich and famous were building huge estates and palatial cottages. St. James Church was consecrated in 1879 and became known as the Church of the Presidents, proclaiming that seven presidents had worshiped there. On July 2nd, 1881, President James Garfield was shot in Washington, D.C. by a crazed gunman. Doctors suggested that President Garfield be taken to a seaside cottage in the Elberon section of Long Branch. He arrived on September 6th, two months after being shot. His presence would focus the eyes of the country on the resort. On the 19th, Garfield complained of sudden heart pain and died. He was only 49 years old. As his body lay in state, long lines of mourners gathered to pay respect. By the 1890s, Long Branch was developing a notorious reputation, attracting an increasing number of professional gamblers and con men. The constant erosion of the Five Mile Bluff along the ocean was causing promoters to look elsewhere. On March 21st, 1894, newly elected state senator and founder of Asbury Park, James A. Bradley, cast the deciding vote to outlaw horse track betting. Mammoth Park never opened for the 1894 season. In 1897, gambling and bookmaking were outlawed. The high society people who had been coming to Long Branch gradually began seeking other resorts as the track and casinos began closing. Howland's glamorous resort was damaged beyond repair by a storm in 1902. The owner of the Ocean Hotel vanished, leaving 100 unpaid employees and mountains of debt to local merchants. 
In 1906, the West End Hotel was torn down. The Elberon and Hollywood both met their fate to fire. It was the beginning of the end for the great brash body resort of Long Branch. In the farming and fishing villages of Deal and Allenhurst, there was Deal Lake, where cottages were built and the lake was used for boating and recreation. A local horse-drawn trolley operated there until it was replaced with an electrified track in 1889. It ran across the lake and extended into Asbury Park. In 1894, the great auditorium opened in Ocean Grove. This magnificent building was constructed by local shipbuilders in 90 days at the cost of $69,000. Boasting the largest pipe organ in the world, it was claimed that 10,000 people could worship there, with 500 seats for the choir alone. Numerous presidents and entertainers have taken the stage there, as well as the famous preacher, Reverend Billy Sunday. The auditorium is still regarded as an engineering marvel and remains the center of annual camp meetings. On the south side of Wesley Lake in Asbury Park, the Palace Merry-Go-Round was constructed in 1888 at Lake Avenue and Kingsley Street. Crafted by master carousel builder Charles Loof, who would soon be joined by a Ferris wheel with 20 carriages. From atop the ride, all of Asbury Park and Ocean Grove could be seen, along with sprawling, picturesque views of the beach and the ocean. In 1880, Coney Island entrepreneur George C. Tilliou brought his steeplechase amusements to Asbury Park, along with his smiling and unmistakable Tilly character. By 1885, the Asbury Park Ocean Grove Railroad Station was serving over 100 trains daily on one peak day, 8,000 people were brought to the Twin Resorts. Over a dozen hotels were serving guests by 1890, and visitors were occupying over 1,000 guest cottages. Some of the most popular accommodations included the Coleman House, the West End Hotel, the Ocean Hotel, and the Hotel Brunswick. By the turn of the century, visitors could stroll on the quiet boardwalk, rest and watch the bathing and beach activity from elegantly fashioned pavilions and casinos, or take a lazy boat ride on Wesley Lake. In 1912, the New York Times estimated that the summer population at Asbury could reach 200,000. Bradley Beach was developed by James A. Bradley and William B. Bradner in the 1870s and it would become a flourishing seaside resort town heading into the 20th century. Several hotels and pavilions were built along its sprawling beaches. 
the Hotel Lorraine, with its sweeping views of the ocean from every room, would become the crowning jewel of the beach community. In 1900, Avon by the Sea became the new name for a little seaside town bordered by the Shark River to the south and Sylvan Lake to the north. The name presumably came from the Avon Inn, which was built in 1883. A quiet boardwalk was built, along with many charming residential cottages. Just to the south, and famous for its oysters and clams, was the town known as Ocean Beach. In 1889, the name was changed to Belmore, taken from the French words Belmer, which means beautiful sea. A boardwalk and fishing pier were built, and by 1890, over 15 hotels were operating there, the largest being the Atlantic, while the most lavish was the Columbia. The Grand Colorado Hotel was also a favorite of vacationers. Several pavilions were built along the beachfront, providing visitors an opportunity to rest, relax, and enjoy an ice cream or soda pop. Yachting was a favorite pastime, and boats docked nearby on the Shark River. Spring Lake was named after a beautiful spring-fed lake, formerly known as Fresh Creek Pond. The prestigious Mammoth House sat between the ocean beach and the lake until it was destroyed by a devastating fire in 1900. A boardwalk along with luxurious mansions were built for the wealthy new visitors and residents arriving from New York and Philadelphia. In 1852, Commodore Robert Stockton, a U.S. Navy hero, bought one of the large farms on the beach north of Manasquan River. He built a 35-room mansion facing the ocean, along with a three-quarter mile track for his racehorses, then named it Seeger. The shore house was expanded to become the beach house, and later the massive Stockton Hotel. Further south at Squan Village, an inn named the Osborne House sat on the village square. The tavern was open as early as 1815 and remained a favorite gathering place for many years. Squan never quite developed into a resort town during these early years, remaining more of a simple farming and fishing village. Nearby on the Manasquan River was Brielle, which became a center for small boat building. Scheduled boat departures left out of the inlet, often heading for New York, loaded with wood and charcoal. Squan Village would officially be named after the river and become Manasquan in 1887.
It wasn't always a donkey. Sometimes it was a horse. Sometimes it was a mule. Whatever they had, yes, they they would they would use that uh, false beacon and the donkey or the mule or the horse or whatever animal they had to confuse a sailor, a captain of a ship offshore, because they relied so much on lighthouses. They would confuse them by simulating a lighthouse to to make them go off course and by the time they hit the breakers it was too late to do anything to correct their course and um, this one uh, account that I have from the state of New Jersey it details all these different wrecks that went down under mysterious circumstances and some of the residents were uh, seen removing things from the bodies and you know personal effects and money and all that her her lover went went to sea and you know she awaited his return but she was part of her father's band of wreckers and when they lured various ships to shore they would strip the bodies of anything of value and of course collect whatever cargo they could and and um one of the bodies that she was uh, stripping and emptying the pockets when she turned the body over it happened to be her lover so she let out this death you know defying scream and uh, ever since she's been walking up and down the beach wailing because she killed her lover Ocean County began south of the Manasquan River in Point Pleasant and extended south to Little Egg Harbor. A string of long barrier islands make up most of its coastal landscape. In 1870, local sea captain John Arnold built a road from his boarding house to Squan Beach in Point Pleasant. The road would later be named Arnold Avenue. By 1872, Clark's Landing on the Manasquan River had developed into a site for boating and recreation with a pavilion and the area's first merry-go-round. town's first big hotel, the Resort House, opened in 1878, and by 1899, Point Pleasant was a flourishing summer resort, with electric trolleys, a newspaper, five churches, and four hotels. The town of Bayhead sits at the head of Barnegat Bay. Incorporated in 1886, a small boat yard was started in the area years before, and boat builders have thrived there ever since, living comfortably among the great beach houses. Further south is Island Beach, a 20-mile barrier peninsula that separates Barnegat Bay from the Atlantic Ocean. A series of small resorts would develop on this stretch of coastline between 1870 and 1900. A few wealthy individuals began building large beach houses along the oceanfront dunes at Mantaloking and Chadwick. Many of those beach houses remain standing today. Albert Lavalette created a resort in honor of his father, the first admiral commissioned in the U.S. Navy. He opened the elegant Sportsman's Hall in the 1870s. Yachting, fishing, and boating have been favorite pastimes there ever since. In 1876, the Baptists founded Seaside Park 
on 300 acres of dunes and sawgrass. It was intended to be a place free from the blighting influences of immorality, drunkenness, and Sabbath desecration. The only transportation to get there was by boat across Barnegat Bay. The first hotel in the area was actually built on the mainland and barged across the bay in pieces. The first cottages built at Seaside were modest compared to some other beach towns. As the place gradually became less devout, it continued to maintain its community spirit. Seaside Park was organized as a borough in 1898. Seaside Heights would be developed into one of New Jersey's most thriving seaside resorts in the 20th century. The borough of Island Beach on the southern end of Barnegat Peninsula had a few sportsman hotels along with an interesting group of people living there called the Baymen. These hardy fishermen lived in small shanties and supplemented their diet and income solely from the waters of Barnegat Bay. Long Beach is an 18 mile long, half mile wide barrier island. Commonly known today as Long Beach Island. The resort of Beach Haven was founded in 1874 and the Parry House opened with rooms for 320 guests. Despite the tales of swarms of mosquitoes in every room, Philadelphians filled the first posh resort on the island. When the Parry House burned to the ground in 1881, with over 200 guests and residents, the owners built the Hotel Baldwin a few blocks away. With its gables and minarets, it was often referred to as Dracula's Castle. The central and northern ends of the island began to develop once the railroad had crossed Barnegat Bay from Manahawkin in the 1880s. The train arrived on the island in an area known as Ship Bottom, and trolleys ran the length of the beach. The small village of Harvey Cedars, once the site of a whale fishery, boasted one of the country's first life-saving stations and a sportsman's hotel. After going by many names like the Great Swamp and Old Mansion, Surf City settled on its name in 1894. The area immediately around Barnegat Light was named Barnegat City. Two hotels were built there in 1880, the Oceanic and the Sunset along with some smaller cottages. Consisting mostly of farming and fishing villages, the area around Tuckerton, Little Egg Harbor, and the Great Bay remained relatively rural and undeveloped until the 20th century. Early in the 1880s, the railroad was extended the length of Apsacon Island. Trains ran excursions to the pristine virgin dunes south of Atlantic City, promoting the pleasure and health benefits derived from the plant and animal life of the sea.
steamboats, ferried visitors to brigantine, and trolleys ran the length of the beach. South Atlantic City became Margate, and in 1882, promoters created a highly successful advertising gimmick, Lucy the Wooden Elephant. Between Margate and Atlantic City, Ventnor was organized in 1903, and at the southern tip of Absecon Island, Longport was founded in 1898. In 1887, Josiah White III traveled from Philadelphia to Atlantic City. He bought a 90-room hotel, the Luray, on Kentucky Avenue, near the beach. The owner was selling because he believed that Atlantic City had reached its peak of popularity. He added 200 rooms to the hotel, along with a storefront on the boardwalk topped with a sun deck. Vacationers fell in love with it. When a fire destroyed the Luray, he built a new hotel, the Marlboro House. When an amusement park opened on the lot outside the Marlboro's windows, he simply bought up the property and constructed the Blenheim in 1906. From the ocean, it resembled a magnificent sandcastle, offering its guests the first fireproof hotel in the city, as well as private baths with fresh and salt running water. Elegant and luxurious hotels were being built or expanded all along the oceanfront, like the Tremor, the Dennis, the St. Charles, and Chalfont Haddon Hall. These hotels made up the center of Atlantic City's thriving boardwalk activity. Amusement piers were becoming a major part of Atlantic City's appeal. In 1884, Applegate's Pier was built at the foot of Tennessee Avenue. It was renamed the Ocean Pier and extended more than a half mile in length. One popular attraction was called the Big Net Hall. Twice a day, a net was raised from the ocean floor, containing bizarre and unusual sea creatures of all kinds. Another pier was built in 1896 at the foot of Massachusetts Avenue, called the Iron Pier. It was later sold to the Heinz Company. Visitors could sample Heinz pickles on their stroll up and down. In 1898, the legendary Steel Pier was built at the foot of Virginia Avenue. 1,760 feet long, it extended over 1,600 feet out into the ocean, featuring a grand auditorium, theater, and music hall, as well as a number of pavilions. Entertainment acts from all over the nation performed on the stages there. It is the only pier still in operation today. Auditorium Pier was built in 1899 on the boardwalk near Pennsylvania Avenue and adjacent to Steel Pier. It was sold to entrepreneur George C. Tilliou in 1908, who would change the name to Steeplechase Pier. 
John Philip Sousa and his 85-piece orchestra were among the many popular performers to play in the auditorium. John Lake Young's Million Dollar Pier opened in 1906. This newest pier had the world's largest ballroom called the Hippodrome, a theater, concert hall, aquarium, and Young's personal home with the postal address 1 Atlantic Ocean. It was described by one enthusiastic visitor as a delightful breathing place on a warm summer's day. Jersey is the best. I don't know why anybody would live anywhere else. And I always tell everybody that God summers in Cape May. So we've seen whales from the ferry. Mm -hmm. Mostly dolphins you see, but occasionally they see whales, mostly humpbacks. Yeah. Almost every day you see dolphins go by in one yeah, direction or the other. Well, pod going by. My memories of Cape May are coming to the beach and there used to be huge waves and we used to um, ride the waves in and body surf and there's always dolphins in the ocean so that's nice and we have a place here so we always go to eat at the lobster house yeah it's always a good time coming here <laughs> long string of narrow barrier islands lies just off the southern coast of the Jersey Shore. At one time, they had been described as the footsteps of giants. In the second half of the 19th century, many of these islands were given a name change. Five Mile Beach became Anglesey and the Wildwoods. Seven Mile Beach across Hereford Inlet became Avalon and Stone Harbor. Ludlums Beach across Townsend's Inlet became Sea Isle City and Strathmere. And Peck's Beach across Corzins Inlet became Ocean City. The coming of the railroad would bring widespread growth to Cape Island and these other areas of Cape May County. In 1879, four Methodist ministers, brothers S. Wesley Lake, Ezra B. Lake, and James Lake, along with the Reverend William H. Burrell, whack their way through the thick underbrush of Peck's Beach. Their goal was to establish a moral, righteous, and devout community. The name they would give it would be Ocean City. A tabernacle was erected at the foot of Wesley Avenue first version of Ocean City's Great Boardwalk opened in 1880. As soon as the railroad crossed Corzin's Inlet onto the island in 1884, this brand new seaside resort began to grow. The boardwalk boasted an auditorium, bathhouses, and a bowling alley that would become 
Moreland's Theater. Casino Pier was constructed at the turn of the century, becoming the Ocean Pier in 1904. Later, the Music Pier was built, where free concerts have long been a regular feature. Ocean City founded itself on being a family-oriented resort and has remained that way. In 1692, Joseph Ludlam purchased the Barrier Island just south of Peck's Beach, selling a portion in 1695 to John Townsend, who named his tract of land Townsend's Inlet. When Charles Landis bought Ludlam's Beach in 1880, the island's only inhabitants were Ludlam's grazing cattle, along with the occupants of life-saving stations 33 and 34. Landis had visions of making Sea Isle City a Venetian-style resort and had several canals dug out along the bay. They were given names like Rio de la More, Rio de la Luna, and Rio Grande. By 1893, pavilions lined the shore. Hotels like the Excursion House and Surf House were the town's centerpieces on the beachfront, and the Continental was advertising steam elevators in the 1890s. Sea Isle City officially became a borough in 1882. Avalon was established in 1887 with the idea of creating a pleasant beach community while preserving the natural beauty of the island. They kept their word and it remains to this day one of the most pristine of all Jersey Shore beaches. In 1897, in an effort to bring train transportation to the island, the Hotel Avalon was constructed along the barren beachfront, as well as a few cottages. In 1910, Stone Harbor was established at the south end of Seven Mile Beach. Lots were sold and cottages constructed. Adopting a similar plan as that of Avalon, a large tract of land was set aside as a sanctuary for wildlife and shorebirds. When Philip P. Baker was visiting Five Mile Beach in 1883, he found himself surrounded by some of the most unusual groves of trees he had ever seen. Pines, oaks, and sassafras trees wrapped around each other with the limbs of some passing through the trunks of others. Beautiful green moss draping the branches all surrounded by White Sand Beach. He purchased 100 acres of this beautiful place and named it Wildwood by the Sea. Ferries carried visitors to the island and soon there were cottages, houses, and a boardwalk. By 1903, a wooden bridge was built across the inlet at Rio Grande Avenue. A pier was erected along with a casino. 
Wildwood Crest was formed in 1910. The Twisted Trees of Wildwood were the first tourist attraction to bring visitors until the boardwalk and long stretches of white sand beaches began to draw thousands. At the north end of Five Mile Beach, fishing and gunning had become a favorite recreation. In 1883, some friends on a fishing trip hatched an idea to build the 50-room Hotel Anglesey. Not aware that the north ends of these islands were prone to getting washed away. Not long after being built, the hotel was lost to the tide and floated out to sea. Anglesey would continue to become a major fishing and recreation area, boasting the best fishing, crabbing, and hunting grounds found anywhere. Hundreds of party boats set out from the piers along Hereford Inlet in quest of sea bass and flounder. In the years following the Civil War, Cape May had struggled to renew its tourism industry. Many Southerners had become bitter toward the North and refused to return to their once beloved seaside resort. By 1873, gambling, entertainment, and the lure of the ocean once again beckoned visitors to its beaches and hotels. Freed black slaves from the south began settling in West Cape May, establishing their own beaches, businesses, churches, and schools. The boardwalk was extended and became known as Flirtation Walk. Horses and carriages rode on the beach as trains and boats carried visitors to the island. Hundreds of bathhouses were constructed along the strand, a nickname given to Cape May's wide stretch of beaches. Once again, the resort and its hotels were flourishing. Then, on the morning of November 9th, 1878, Cape May residents were waking up when smoke began filling the sky. Several hundred people gathered on the beach to watch in shock as flames broke through the roof of the 46-year-old Ocean House. Residents started a bucket brigade. When firefighters arrived with their worn-out equipment, they were no match for the spreading blaze. Flames shot out of the windows of Congress Hall as the fire spread to other buildings. One after another, private cottages and lavish affluent homes were vanishing in the fire and smoke. At Washington and Perry Streets, the center house collapsed to the ground. 700 bathhouses at the Stockton Hotel on Beach Avenue were destroyed. Bolstered by high winds, the fire jumped to the Columbia Hotel on Ocean Street, three blocks away. In 10 minutes, 
the prestigious hotel was an inferno. Finally, after almost 10 hours, the fire was contained, leaving in its wake the charred remains of half the city. 35 acres, including the heart of downtown, went up in smoke. The final damage exceeded a half million dollars and included nine hotels, 30 boarding houses, businesses, and cottages, along with countless bathhouses. This would be the fourth great fire to ravage Cape May. Wealthy residents and visitors did not abandon their favorite vacation spot, however. They would rebuild and compete for the best cottages. These new seaside homes and buildings were constructed in the most modern Victorian designs of the day. From Gothic Revival to Queen Anne style, fashioned in rich pastel colors and accented with gingerbread trim, gables, turrets, and widow's walls. Many of the buildings built during this Victorian age can still be found in Cape May today, helping to create the town's character so many find charming.